Waiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Waiguru Ji Ki Fateh. Thank you for joining us for another discussion on Sabad Hajare Batsahi Dasmi. I'm Jasleen Gore. I'm a research associate at Sikri, and I'm joined today again by Harinder Singh, co-founder of Sikri and innovation director. Fateh Harinder Singh, how are you? I'm oh, well, Gur Fateh, and uh, to you and everyone listening, Waiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Waiguru Ji Ki Fateh. So uh, before we get into the conversation, uh, I'm going to play a recitation by Harjinder Singh, who is a research associate in Gurbani linguistics. And then I'll be reading the English translation. A note about the pronunciation in this recitation is that it follows the most simple and non-discretionary pattern meant for the masses. So Harjinder Singh is pronouncing it the way it's inscribed. Let's take a listen. Wah Guru Ji Ka Khalsa Wah Guru Ji Ki Fatah Ram Kali Patisahi Dasmi Re Mana Eh Bidh Jog Kamao Singhi Saachu Akapt Kanthula Tiyanu Biput Chadao Rahao Tanti gaho atam basikar ki Pichha namu adharam Bajja param tar tat hariko Upaja ragu rasaram Ugta tan tarang rangiat Gyan geet bandanam Chak chak rahe dev danav mone छक छक ब्योम विवानम आत्म उपदेश पेश संजम को जाप सु अजपा जापे सदा रह कंचन सी कायाम काल न कब हूँ व्यापे वाहि गुरु जी का खालसा वाहि गुरु जी की now that we've taken a listen to the recitation, I'm going to read the English translation and we'll get into the conversation. Ramkali Sovereign 10. O oh mind, earn the union by this method. Consider truth as a horn, non-deception a necklace, and ascend ash of contemplation. Pause, reflect. Control inner self as to hold a one-string instrument, and nam identification as a support to receive alms. Experience the essence of Har One as the sound of supreme strings. That's where melodious musical modes emerge. Wave of color love arises from melodic improvisations and compositions of songs of deep knowledge. Gods, demons, and sages witness in amazement. Those riding skies are in happiness. Control inner self as the instruction. Practice self-restraint as garb. Unrecitable recitation as the recitation. That's how the body always remains golden. The fear of death does not affect it. So, Harinder Singh, I wanted to ask you a bit about the context of this Shabbat. And I know that from our last conversation, Ramkali is a musical mode that evokes emotions of discipline and pain and triumph. Um, and you had also spoken about this like idea of the budding of the beautiful. But I wanted to know more about the particular context of this Shabbat because we are dealing with this uh, yoga paradigm. So the title you had chosen for your translation was Yoga Disrupted. And then this question of what kind of yoga. So if you could elaborate on that paradigm for those who aren't familiar with, with it, um, that would be great. Sure. Uh, so it is Rag Ramkali. And in Ramkali, uh, other than this idea of uh, objects which we will be dealing with, uh, where we can see how the discipline, pain, and the triumph comes around it's for us to actually have our own budding. But I want to introduce another thing here because the word gets invoked within this Shabbat. 
there is a rust of things. We talked about there's a rust or a flavor or a sentiment of a rag. And Ramkali's rust, as they call it, uh, in its musical expression has multiple shades and subtleties of gray. That's the understanding in the Indian classical music. In fact, it is even associated with their god or their deity or the messenger called Yama, the Jama, the Jam, the Dut, the messenger of death. And you'll notice that, that those references are coming very much directly into the Shabad as well. So the yoga paradigm, many of us are aware of this, but we are aware of it as more like an exercise these days. You know, what harm it is if it, we are doing something to discipline the body. No, it's nothing. It is. It cannot just be reduced to that although that's what we are aware of. So this particular Shabad, the first Shabad got into the sannyas element from the yogi idea. Here, this is exactly about yoga. Yoga, yoga, or yoga are exactly same things. What we are mostly familiar with, just lean, especially in the West, we are used to seeing these signs of Vikram yogas or Hatha yoga. Well, they are an element which comes out of this yogic philosophy. And that yogic philosophy is a, one of the six uh, schools of Hindu philosophies. It is much more than uh, what we are used to. I mean, it's yoga has many practices all over the world. And even in, in our Netflix documentary, some of us may be watching, you see some of that. Where eventually the objective is to control and still the mind. That's what yoga is really after. And it has many popular forms. And Hatha and Tantric happen to be making it to most documentaries and billboards these days. So in that context, the word jog really matters because this is talking about what is the method for the jog. And jog literally is union. It is also the word which is used as a, one of the six systems of Hindu philosophy, popularly called yoga now. Yeah, I think that's really important because when I first read the word jog, I immediately thought only of yoga. And, and I think that like multi-layered meaning is important because that paradigm is being sort of reconfigured or subverted. So that actually brings me to the next question because it is about that first line where the guru says, oh mind, earn the union by this method. So you've already talked about union, but I also wanted to ask you about earn because we've seen in our work on the Guru Granth Sahib project that this word earn comes when we're talking about earning service or earning pilgrimage. Um, and I wonder what it means to earn union, like how you understand that phrase. Um, because there's two things that I think about when I think about like that as a phrase is like the first one is that we maybe think that union or connection is kind of up to just chance um, so that there's like no agency or effort or anything that needs to be made towards that goal. It's just like either you get it or you don't, which I think is one kind of school of thought. But then I'm also thinking about like these paradigms that we've been talking about and sort of this like transactional relationship that we could have with the one um, where we think that like if we do enough sort of things or go through enough of the sort of spiritual motions, we will have built up a kind of like spiritual credit. <laughs> and then we can, and it's like through that accumulation of like earning certain rituals or certain cleansings that we can earn union. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know what you think about that. Maybe that's a stretch, but that's kind of how I've, how I've understood it. And I wanted to hear from you as well. Well, that's a good way to uh, uh, at least create one understanding of it because we are used to transactional methods in this world, even in our relationships, right? So yeah. firstly, I mean, this is Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj talking, right? So when Sahib, the sovereign is talking, uh, he is, it's very important. Just like the first Shabad, it spoke to the mind, which means it is about the self. This Shabad is also speaking to the mind, which means it is a direction to my mind. And what Guru Gobind Singh is telling me when I personalize is, is how do you unite? Harinder, are you listening to what Guru Gobind Singh Sahib is saying, how to unite with the one? Because there is a separation from the one. So what he's saying is, you can either attach yourself or join yourself, 
uh, with the one or harness yourself as the way yoga is telling or the yogic philosophy is telling, or you can do this. And this part is where he describes his method because every yogi, every Siddh, every guru, or whatever else word we may say in the West or the East, they have their own method. And this is Guru Gobind Singh Sahib's method, where he essentially is saying all this paraphernalia, all these things which yogis do, he's going to say, instead of those, these are the things which I would do to unite. And earning part is very important here. I think there's a wordplay going on there. Are you picked up on that? Earning is, which means it requires effort, which is what you were talking about, but there's something else going on. Mm. Earning requires effort, of course. The other part is yogis didn't earn. Mm, yeah. they, they are always critiquing the people who are earning, but they go to them for their survivals. So earning here is, this is a self effort. The mind needs to understand you cannot pay someone to do things for you. Mm. You have to do it yourself. And it is at the same time saying, be very careful. To me, it's saying this. Mm -hmm. I rather be very careful people who don't earn their living because they are just philosophizing or they're doing something else. So earning here implies that everyday people do understand earning. Yogis don't earn mm -hmm. in the sense we earn in the way we were discussing transactionally, right? Yeah. So earning is effort as well as a wordplay with uh, everyday people who understand what earning really is, the level of effort it takes, the physical effort it, it takes as well. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think, yeah, it's always, it's fun for me to like dive into the kind of layers of certain word choices. I think there's always more to discover. But um, you had mentioned like the paraphernalia of the yogi, which brings me to that next, that next part of the Raha line where... Guru Gobind Singh Sahib says, consider truth as a horn, non-deception a necklace, and ascend ash of contemplation. So horn, necklace, ash. These are like the the like the sort of physical elements of the yogi the yogi's, I don't know, uniform or sort of world. Uh, paraphernalia is a good word to use. But I wanted to sort of ask a little bit more about that specifically because coming from my context, I'm not super sure on what the horn is um, yeah. or the necklace. I know we talked about the ash in um, in our first podcast on Shabbat One, but if you could kind of take us through that, that yeah. other set of elements, that would be great. Well, the paraphernalia is attached to a practice. So they are not paraphernalias for the sake of paraphernalias. Yeah. Yogis do utilize them. They're part of their rituals. So the horn, they actually call it singi. The, the rosary-like necklace they are uh, uh, being referenced here is what they call kanthala, which is made of rudra beads. I mean, if you go online and Google it, people are selling this everywhere in the world these days because they believe particular beads create particular effects hmm. to have in the, either as a rosary or as a necklace. And bibhut is obviously an ash, which they're either putting on a particular part of the body or throughout their body. Mm. And what this is saying to me is that, uh, that the, the Guru Sahib is disrupting all of that again. And the 10th Sovereign very clearly says, it's really, you need to play the music of truth, which essentially means voicing the truth. And otherwise voicing the horn is just one practice based on one particular paraphernalia. And the other thing will be, instead of wearing this necklace, having this rosary-like necklace or kantala made of rudra beads, how about if I actually am not deceptive in my living? Deception is what the guru is after. Just like in the first phrase, uh, the musical truth is what guru is after. And the third part is, look, I don't need to rub anything on my body. Uh, if I do want to rub something on my body, it is not a substance. Mm -hmm. It is the contemplation, contemplating the tihan. Uh, mm -hmm. Earlier it was Nam. The first Shabbat said Nam. Now the word Tehan is coming into play, which is contemplating on how do I unite with the one, have a union with the one. Yeah. And, and I think that this also gets at what you had said in the last podcast episode in some way about like, even those who are renunciates are not fully renunciates because mm -hmm. there's all these like systems and things that they have sort of tools of tools of spiritual practice or tools of 
attempting some kind of connection. So it's just interesting because this listing of objects, I think, kind of evokes that juxtaposition. And, and we need to apply this listing to the current Sikh practices as well. Yeah. It is not about yogic practice. That's just an example. Those who choose to do that, if you want to accept a particular yogi as your guru, that's your prerogative. Mm -hmm. I'm accepting and the Sikh Panth accepts uh, Dasve Pasha as the guru. So I'm interested in what he's defining. And if you notice, his stuff is all about not substances which we are used to, hmm. but the behaviors we need to be getting used to. Yeah. And this is the real big jump. So if six get upset about a particular paraphernalia, if I may call it again, or a particular tool or a practice, if it is not in line with some other six practice, I mean, we need to pause there. That's mm -hmm. what they're saying. That's the pause line. Wait a second. Is the is the is the truth coming out? Is deception going away? Is contemplation entering? Because this is the method to unite with the one. This is the method to end the separation, which is causing so many pains in life. Yeah, that's really helpful because again, it's really easy to mistakenly read these as like not being applicable to us. <laughs> so so thank you for that um, sort of expansion um, of of the literal into something into something that we can also understand as being applicable to ourselves. I'm really interested in the mention of music in this in this composition. Um, and I'll read the lines before I ask this question. But the guru says, experience the essence of HUD one as the sound of supreme strings. That's where melodious musical modes emerge. Wave of color love arises from melodic improvisations and compositions of songs of deep knowledge. There's a lot to unpack there, but I guess the first question I have is like, why, in your understanding, why music? Like why, why mention music? Because music is where we connect in a, uh, what we'll say non-analytical sense. Mm -hmm. This is that part of our brain, our personalities, our existence, where things are nadam. Everything is not vedam. Mm -hmm. Vedang is the literary element of things. And this is Guru Nanak telling us in Jabjisa very clearly. Mm -hmm. If there is one thing which Guru did, it was singing, singing the Shabbat, because the, the word part is understanding. Sound part is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that is through the music. And this is why in this line, the yogis yield, you know, that one string instrument is actually called a kingri. It's like, you know, is this kingri helping you control your mind? Or are you just playing this because you also need to have an instrument? Mm -hmm. Has Nam become your support uh, uh, instead of the support bag you carry? And it's in this context, and the bag is to collect the arms, which arms, which general public earns, you know? Uh, and, and in that context, Guru says, it's the rasaran part. I'm very interested. It's are you experiencing the ras of this music, the vibrations of Hari? the one who eliminates the fear, the one who is all pervasive, the one who is all force, are you experiencing the strike of that hurt, that vibration, mm -hmm. that melody, um, which will help us identify with the uh, that hurt, you know? So, because mm -hmm. we are suffering, right? In suffering, everything, I mean, we can't be lecturing people in suffering. There are pangs of separation. In fact, I use the word panacea to end this separation is the music, is what this line is saying. So if I want to personally identify with the uh, what Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj is saying and we want to become intimate with it, music is very much part of that. And he continues on this. He's like, if you want waves and waves of these music, you need to be colored in the love of the beloved. The yogis don't enjoy ras. They are very anti-ras. And Guru is saying we need to be completely experiencing the ras. It's only then the anand comes, the joy comes. That's the that's the interpretation of this. Out of these songs, these taans, he used the word taan, which is improvisation as well. Uh, taan is also like a sort of a longest uh, melodic passage, you know, in the in the musical system of Hindustani paramparas. But what the Guru is really after is this: look, the music plays a huge. It strikes within you. It creates some melody within you. And this melody helps us end our suffering, suffering of separation, the hijr. And the more this music plays, 
both the one which is defined just like in the ramkali rag it's defined but undefined which is the one which plays within you when you are drenched when you are colored when you are in love and that harmony is what a naam produces within you this is really when the knowledge even the deeper knowledge the songs of deeper knowledge will be coming to you at that time so actually the music helps you gain knowledge hmm. and the music helps you create vibrations which otherwise you are not ready because you're too con- otherwise you're fixated on or concentrating on particular mudra on how to sit and what to contemplate on on one particular word guru is saying all that gets disrupted when the musical harmony is born within you and this one line a one string instrument is not enough and the the example he gives is even the gods you believe in the demons you believe in the sages you believe in they all listen to this music and this is how the naam was born in them and even the ones who are riding in the skies and let me just cover that one i know it's a little bit long response riding in the skies was one of the challenging things i had to figure in this one out what does it really mean i had to think he you know who is riding in the skies you know we think of this mythological characters who are the chariots and the charioteers riding well actually it's natural stuff as well the suns the moons and the stars they are also listening to the music and the way i got that insight was because guru nanak sahib tells us sare ga rahe hain in jab ji and rehras we read this that it's the it's the, the song which everyone is singing so the ones who are riding in the skies which means yeah you know, whatever is available to us in this co- cosmic systems we live in and the suns moon stars and other galaxy systems we are so though they they are also listening to this music mm. so music is universal music is even the ones you believe who are condemned like demons even they it helps them and the ones who are blessed like gods as they believe and on your masters and your sages so everyone's listening to this music and this music which you externally listen to produces internal harmony i've been thinking about the like improvisation line and i know we had sort of talked about this in our conversations but like i remember like this is a little bit of a tangent but i remember being like in a cappella in college <laughs> and so i'd sing in an a cappella group and something that i think i came to understand about the moments when you're improvising is that like if you're if you're thinking when you're trying to do it it won't work mm-hmm. and it has to like really come out of you and there's kind of like a i know we had talked about this but like you have to first train to be able to not think to be able to just feel and so it's not that like there's no effort required but it's that like you train and you put that effort in and then in that moment when you're trying to improvise when the song is coming out of you in that way your brain is off and it's all like heart it's all feeling and i think that's something that has stuck with me about this composition of like part of the paradigm that we're all in whether we're yogis or not is that we tend to stay at the mind yeah. and and the mind is so stubborn even when we're like explaining what a musical mode evokes like emotion wise it's not going to capture it the way that just like listening to it and feeling it would right like these are these are things that we can't sort of put into words all the way so that's really stuck with me um, and 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 this experience because you are practicing particular musical system right so mm-hmm. you have that experience now in the line in this shab- sabad's line guru gobind singh maharaj is an ustad in music as well he plays instruments and he vocals he writes he composes he writes and he reveals all these words we use right and sings so this line actually goes to from this human element you talked about to the next elements that mm. tapi gaho atambas you know like baje param tat i mean tar tat so all these you can you can think about string instruments is like multiple varieties of these are being played mm. and when they play harko but imagine now they are playing the actual hari is the hari way guru gobind sings hari not the gods and goddesses hari which are the incarnations of vishnu mm. is like multiple instruments are being played they are singing the songs of har mm. and out of those playings then upja rag rasarang and this is this is the most beautiful line in the shabad for me because upja is that something which is born mm. 
So there is no effort. Effort part is the first part. All this is getting played. And then something is born in that environment. It's like the gava when the orchestra is playing and then the tan is going to come and that uh, uh, rag rasaran, you are going to enjoy this music. Ras, there is a sentiment which will be born. There's a flavor which you will taste. And then the next says, then improvisation comes on its own. Ugdha tan, tarang rang. And then out of that rises this wave of tan, this improvisation. And out of that improvisation is then born the gyan, geet bandhana. That song of knowledge is born in that environment. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think I, I only really have one more question that's kind of along a similar line, not as much music as it is recitation. <laughs> um, so the second to last line, um, the guru says, control inner self as the instruction, mm -hmm. practice self-restraint as garb. And then this is the part that I'm wondering about, unrecitable recitation as the recitation. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, and I think it's like a question that I've had in other sort of situations too, in other Shabbats of like, what is this unrecitable recitation that is being referred to here? And I, I fully understand that I'm in my mind right now, after we talked about being in the heart, but I wanted to know what you think, what you think that's like getting at. Yeah. So the actual phrase, what you are referring to is job. So ajappa japa. Now, look, first thing is in the larger context of Guru Granth Sahib and the gurus, we know they tell us that this is something which cannot be recited with something, a story of her cannot be narrated. It's unnarratable, but whatever experience we have, we narrate that. So I cannot narrate that. Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj is narrating this. And what he's saying in this context is, look, you can, you can keep working on the instructions of Yogi on how he likes to control, or you can work on controlling the mind. Remember, that's the method he's after, which is different than Yogi's method. So what in that method, what is the practice? He says, you can practice wearing the garbs of the Yogi, or you can practice certain self-restraints from the vices. And out of those practices, naturally then, what cannot be recited, you get to recite. So it happens naturally. This part is, this is why I had to talk about the first part. It says, Atam Upades Pes Sanjam Ko Jaap So Ajappa Jaap You know, so when you stop doing certain practices and start doing other practices. And this is where our dichotomies are. Guru is very clear that you need to do uh, change your practice. And then this unrecitable recitation will happen, which basically means you're not forcing specific recitations, specific mantras, specific phrases, like the yogis and the other non-yogi yogis also tell us to do. So Guru is not telling us to do that. He says, this is, if you are interested in earning this union, and if you want your body to remain golden, let me connect it to that. And what is remaining golden? You know, we all, the gold standards, the gold, what gets used in a different ways, which basically means uh, the fear of death is not there. Mm -hmm. You are healthy, you're fearless, and you are uh, remaining in this union with the one. Mm -hmm. So essentially it is about coming out of the fixations of the yoga and developing the intimate feeling for the one, intimate love for the one, and the musical elements help us develop that love. And that's where the yoga that matters to Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj is that of uh, what is being described here of the union, not the yoga of particular paraphernalia or practice. Yeah. So Ajappa Jap is something which is born within you in that environment when we have changed the way we think and we have changed the way we practice certain things. Yeah, I think that both the framing of like, what is the music of the yogis, which is not really like, it's like more like a one tone thing versus yeah. the music that the guru is talking about. What is the recitation that the yogis do versus this unrecitable recitation? Like, I think that play is really interesting. And I thank you so much for providing the context around both of those. I think that we can sort of close the conversation now with just a final question about like what 
has stuck out to you about this composition? What's what's stuck with you um, over the period of time that you've been working on it? Um, yeah, I'm just interested in that. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a Guru's approach, right? Guru doesn't say don't do yoga. He's like, let's do this kind of yoga. Mm. So it's always not saying don't do this, which is sort of our habits these days. Yes. He's like, let's do it like this, which is essentially reframing and giving a solution what to do instead of saying what you are doing is because what we're doing is not working. So you can refine what is not working. You can change its outer manifestations. This approach of the guru is beautiful. And obviously the challenge here was, as I mentioned, that uh, how do you uh, interpret chak chak byom bivanang? That was the line. Like who's riding in the skies? And obviously the larger context of Guru Granth Sahib helped in there. And the ajappa jap part you talked about, yeah, because we cannot narrate this. That's why we need help of the guru. And here Gaur Gobind Singh Maharaj is helping us actually recite that, narrate that for us. And remember I mentioned to end this, that Ramkali in the Indian systems for the yogis including has a grayest idea and this grayness, they deal with the yama, the death. And the line, the shabad ends with that idea. Mm -hmm. That it's actually playing with the yogis that you also fear death. It's playing with us, we all fear death that that grayness within you will not even come will will have any effect on you if you have ended your separation with the one the ones who are in the separation with the one they are the ones where the fear of death uh, actually enters and remains if you want it to go away it's it's again uh, number one thing we all understand we may not be able to identify with certain things in certain troubles we all identify them Death does worry us. We are concerned about death. He's like, okay, if nothing else, at the end of the day, this fear will go out of you when you are connected with this kind of yoga, this kind of union with the one. Beautiful. I I know I'll probably say this every episode, but <laughs> this has been really wonderful and, and really inspiring to kind of delve into this more deeply. So I hope our listeners are also feeling inspired by this conversation and maybe picking up on a word or phrase or something that they're going to keep thinking about um, in their own journeys. So thank you very much, Rinder Singh. Absolutely. Um, and as a reminder, remember it is about the celebration of Guru Gobind Singh Maharaj. Yeah. So the way Pai Balveer Singh sings this, if you listen to his rendition, perhaps that element of Rag Rasarang, mm -hmm. we may be able to get glimpses of that and a particular harmony or melody or a wave of love may born within us as well. Yeah. Thank you for reminding the listeners about that as well. And I think, um, yeah, as always, uh, I hope that you'll join us again next time. Thank you, Harinder Singh. Oh, thank you, Jocelyn, for uh, weaving in your excellent questions and uh, to all the listeners. Vaigur Ji Ka Khalsa. Vaigur Ji Ka Khalsa.